Okay, so um, let me see. Where am I? Hang on. This thing is blocking what I need to read. Okay. B. Any person while acting as a debt collector for another person, I think I'm continuing on from where I left off, both of whom are, we're using a news computer system here, so bear with us, guys. Both of whom are related by common ownership or affiliated by corporate control. If the person acting as a debt collector does not, does so only for persons to whom it is so related or affiliated, and if the principal business of such person is not the collection of debts. C, in parentheses, in brackets, in brackets. Any officer or employee of the United States, there's that word of again, which kind of reads to me, without the United States or any state, to the extent that the collecting or attempting to collect any debt is in the performance of his official duties. D, any person while serving or attempting to serve legal process or any other person in connection with the judicial enforcement of any debt. E, any nonprofit organization which at the request of consumers performs bona fide consumer credit counseling and assists consumers in the liquidation of their debts by receiving payments from such consumers and distributing such amounts to creditors. And oh, Okay, where am I? Um, I think I was at, um, I read B already, C, any office or employee of the United States or any state to the extent that collecting or attempted to collect any debts is in the performance of his official duties. D, any person while serving or attempting to serve legal process on any other person in connection with ju judicial um, enforcement <clears throat> of any debt. What was this regarding? I kind of lost my way here. Hold on. This was on the section um, definitions as used in the Fair Debt Collections Practices Act. E, any nonprofit organization which, at the request of consumers, performs bona fide consumer credit counseling and assists consumers in liquidation of their debts by receiving payments from such consumers and distributing such amounts to the creditors. And F, any person collecting or attempting to collect any debt owed or due or asserted to be owed or due to another, to the extent such activity is incidental to a bona fide fiduciary obligation or bona fide escrow arrangement. Um, this is to, I think it's like the Roman numerals. Concerns a debt to, dot, to like two eyes. Concerns a debt which was originated by such person. Three, concerns a debt which was not in default at the time it was obtained for such, by such person. Or concerns a debt, um, concerns a debt obtained by such person as a secured party in a commercial credit transaction involving the creditor. I'm a secured party, guys. Okay, the term... Location information means a consumer's place of abode and his telephone number at such place or his place of employment. The term state means any state, territory, or possession of the United States that's with the United States District of Columbia, the Commonwealth of Puerto Rico, or any political subdivision, <clears throat> or any of the foregoing. Next. Mm. 15 U.S.C. 1692b, um, 804, Acquisition of Location Information. Any debt collector communicating with any person other than the consumer for the, per for the purpose of acquiring location information about the consumer shall, one, identify himself, state that he is confirming or collecting, correcting location information concerning the consumer, and if only expressly requested, Identify his employer. Two, in brackets, no state that such, not state that such consumer owes any debt. Three, in brackets, not communicate with any such person more than once unless requested to do so by such person or unless the debt collector reasonably 
believes that the earlier response of such person is erroneous or incomplete, or that such person now has correct or complete location information. Four, not communicate by postcard. Five, not use any language or symbol or any envelope or in the context, context contents of any communication affected by the mails or telegram that indicates that the debt collector is in the debt collection business or that the communication relates to the collection of a debt. Six, after the debt collector knows the consumer is represented by an attorney with regard to the subject debt and has knowledge of or can readily ascertain such attorney's names and address, not communicate with any person other than that, other than that attorney, unless the attorney fails to respond within a reasonable period of time to communication from the debt collector. I'm reading this out loud for people like myself, families who homeschool, people who are disabled, widows, people who are senior citizens, like my parents, grandparents, um, children, schools, teachers, anybody that doesn't have the time or can see who are blind or handicapped like myself who need assistance to hear. I'm reading this as loud as I possibly can with the assistance that I'm given. It's for all those people who need to know true law, the Fair Debt Collections Practices Act. I'll continue to do so and make it public record so it's easier for us. And what I, the thing I like about somebody actually reading it like myself is that I can actually, I've been doing this for a long time, so I kind of have an idea as to what it means. So it's not just a, a robot reading it to the people. All right, continue. 15 U.S.C. 1692C 805, commun communication in connection with debt collections. Communication with the consumer generally without, this is A, without the prior consent of the consumer given directly to the debt collector or the express permission of a court of competent jurisdiction, a fair debt collector may not communicate with the consumer in connection with the collection of any debt. Oh, you can find this at the ftc.gov slash enforcement slash rules slash rulemaking, um, that little, what, thing, line, whatever, um, regulatory it looks like. So if you click on the ftc.gov and just type in federal um, Fair Debt Collections Practices Act, this will come up. One, at any unusual time or place or time or place known or which should be known to be con inconvenient to the consumer in the absence of knowledge of circumstances to the contrary. A debt collector shall assume that the convenient time for communicating with the consumer is 8 o'clock. And Midirian and before 9 o'clock, post meridian local time at the consumer's location. If the debt collector knows the consumer is represented by an attorney with respect to, this is number two, with respect to such debt and has knowledge of or can readily ascertain such attorney's name and address, unless the attorney fails to respond with in a reasonable period of time to communication from a debt collector or unless the attorney consists, consents to direct communication with the consumer. I just want to make a note here, any of those, any of you who are out there or secured party creditors or Moors or Moabites or anyone claiming their birthright or anyone having to go to court for um, purported debts, I highly recommend you do it on your own in layman's terms. Don't try to quote legalese. You can quote this Fair Debt Collections Practices Act if you understand it and 18 U.S.C. 1341, which is Mail Fraud and Swindles Act and 18 U.S.C. 1343, Telecommunications Fraud. And those of you really abreast, you know you can go after them and charge them. I forget the fee. For each and every telephone contact or every contact of trespass, you can charge them. And there's many out there that are doing it. You can go on YouTube and research that. B, communication. What? Yeah, if you do bring a lawyer, you consider it incompetent. So just keep bear that in mind. Um, and yeah, I, I said to, before, I tend to write to um, parties before I go in anyways and present my stuff. Um, yeah, I have some I'm disabled. So. B, communication with the third parties, except as provided in Section 1692B of this title without the prior consent of the consumer given directly to the debt collector or to the express permission of a court. Um, oh, check out that court case, Montgomery versus, what was the guy's name? Was it Gilliam, I think? Um, the one where he got to pay in coffee beans. 
researched that case. I thought that was really, I think he owed a thousand in debt. His wife had used his credit card and the judge accidentally said he could pay in frankincense and myrrh and then came on and said he could pay in coffee beans. Montgomery versus, I think it's Gilliam. Look it up, guys. Um, and email me. I got it written down somewhere. Or the express permission of a court. It's a Supreme Court case law. Or the express permission of a court of competent jurisdiction or as reasonably necessary to effectuate a post-judgment judicial remedy, a debt collector may not communicate in connection with the collection of any debt with any person other than the consumer, his attorney, a consumer reporting agency, if otherwise permitted by law, the creditor, the attorney of the creditor, or the attorney of the debt collector, which basically means if they're coming to your neighbor or going to your workplace or talking to your boss, that's against the rules. Ooh. Are your parents or whoever else family members? Ceasing communication. Number this is C. If a consumer notifies a debt collector in writing that the consumer refuses to pay a debt or that the consumer wishes the debt collector to cease further communication with the, with the consumer, the debt collector shall not communicate further with the consumer with respect to such debt except, number one, to advise the consumer that the debt collector's further efforts are being terminated, number two, to notify the consumer that the debt collector or creditor may invoke specified remedies which are ordinarily invoked by such debt collector or creditor. Or number three, that's us, eh? We're the we're the creditor. So we're the ones that are being exploiting those, invoking probably liens or what have you. Uh, number three, we're applicable to notify the consumer that the debt collector or creditor intends to invoke a special remedy, a specified remedy. If such notice from the consumer is made by mail, notification shall be complete upon receipt. So all these threats that I hear and FTC selling me, sending me all these cases that they're dealing with, it's not right. D, consumer defined. Yeah, debt collectors threatening them and stuff. They're not supposed to do that. D, consumer uh, in parentheses defined. For the purpose of this um, section, the term consumer includes con the consumer's spouse, parent, if the consumer is a minor, guardian, executor, or administrator. Okay, 15 U.S.C. 1692D, 806, harassment or abuse. Now, this is what I was subject to recently by Ms. Catherine Francis. A debt collector may not engage in the conduct, in any conduct, the, any, any, in any conduct, the natural consequence of which is to harass, oppress, or abuse any person in connection with the collection of a debt. Without limiting the general application of the foregoing, the following conduct is a violation of this section. Number one, the use or threat of use of violence or other criminal means to harm the physical person, reputation, or property of any person. And I need air to breathe, so that was harming me. Number two, the use of obscene or profane language or language, the natural consequence of which is to abuse the hearer or reader. Uh, number three, the publication of a list of consumers who allegedly refuse to pay debts except to a consumer reporting agency or to persons meeting the requirements of section 1681A in parentheses F or 1681B in parentheses 3 with a little one beside it of this title. Number four, the adver advertisement for sale of any debt to her or her's payment of the debt. So, you know, they send you those things saying they're going to sell your properties, foreclosure, what have you. Really look into those contracts, you guys, and whether you have a contract, because a lot of times you don't even have a contract. You're the only one that ends up signing those documents, and that's not a, pro a proper four-way contract. A four-way, a proper contract has four corners. Um, five, five, causing a telephone to ring um, or engaging any person in telephone conversation repeatedly or continuously with intent to annoy, abuse, or harass any person at the call number. Number six, except as provided in section 1692B of this title, the placement of telephone calls without meaningful disclosure of the caller's identity. So what we get here with this, this corporation um, is a text message or an email. Um, very disconcerting on a Sunday afternoon, you get this thing on your phone, your cell phone, and it doesn't say who it's from, it doesn't say who it's to, it just comes up and it posts, posts these ridiculous um, extortion numbers 29,424 
244.44 and you're like, what? <laughs> and when you call them to try to get it rectified, you're kind of given um, what we've discovered to run around. So we're trying to get this thing settled and discharged proper with the proper numbers and get our, our status corrected. We'll see what they do next. 15 U.S.C. 1692E, 807, false or misleading representations. A debt collector may not use any false, deceptive, or misleading representation or means in connection with the collection of any debt without limiting the general application of, of the foregoing. The following conduct is a violation of this section. Number one, the false representation of implication that the debt collector is vouched, vouched for, bonded by, or affiliated with the United States of or any state, Jamaica private corporation, ward, nation, state, including the use of any badge, police, uniform, or facsimile thereof. Badge, that's what they use on a lot of us is bring out these um, private, um, what do they call them, private mercenaries? Um, they, what, did, what did Taj call them? They're called New York, gangs of New York, wearing costumes, carrying weapons on the roadway to stop and harass people in uniforms known as police officers. Um, purporting a debt, saying that they work for the corporation when you didn't even know you thought they were representing you, the public. Ah, you were wrong. Number two, the false representation of A, the character amount of legal status or any debt, or B, any services rendered or compensation which may be lawfully received by any debt collector for the collection of a debt, the false representation or implication that any individual is an attorney, or that any communication is from an attorney, Carrie Ann Gibbs, look up what that means. Find out what about the bar, what happened to the bar. What did the Pope say July 4th, 2014 to Barack Obama about the bar? Number four, the representation of the implication that non-payment of any debt will result in the arrest or imprisonment of any person or the seizure, garnishment, attachment, or sale of any property or wages or any person unless such action is lawful and the debt collector or creditor intends to take such action. I was at the ask for the 1099 OIDs at this point. Five, JPS Terry Ann Gibbs, send it to me please, thank you. Five, the threat to take any action that cannot legally be taken or that is not intended to be taken. Number six, the false representation or implication that a sale referral or other transfer of any interest in a debt shall cause the consumer to A, lose any claim or defense to payment or defense to payment of the debt or B, become subject to any practice prohibited by the subchapter 7, the false representation or implication that the consumer committed any crime or other conduct in order to disgrace the consumer what we have dealing with here. We're disgraced and shamed. Anyways, number nine, the use or distribution of any written communication in which stipulates, simulates, or is falsely represented to be a document authorized, issued, or approved by any court, official, or agency of the United States or any state. There's that little word of again. Are which creates a false impression as to its source, authorization, or approval. Carrie Ann Gibbs, private corporate nation state, you can't use that. Number 10, the use of any false representation or deceptive means to collect or attempt to collect any debt or to obtain information concerning a consumer. Number 11, the failure to disclose in the initial written communication with the consumer and in addition if the initial communication with the consumer is oral in that initial oral communication that the debt collector is attempting to collect the debt and that any information obtained will be used for, the perp for that purpose. And the failure to disclose in subsequent communications that the communication is from a debt collector except that this paragraph shall not apply to a formal pleading made in connection with a legal action. Number 12, the false representation of it or implication that accounts have been turned over to innocent purchasers for value. Number 13, the false representation of implication that documents are legal process. Number 14, the use of any business, company, or organization name 
other than the true name of the debt collector's business, company, or organization. Number 15, the false representation of implication or implication that documents are not legal process forms or do not require action by the consumer. Number 16, the false representation or implication that a debt collector operates or is employed by a consumer reporting agency as defined by section 1681A F of this title, 15 U.S.C. 1692F, 808, unfair practices. A debt collector may not use unfair or unconscionable means to collect or attempt to collect any debt without limiting the general application of the foregoing. The following conduct is a violation of the section. Number one, the collection of any amount, including any interest fee, charge, or expense incidental or to the principal obligation unless such amount is expressly authorized by the agreement creating the debt or permitted by law. I did not agree to pay any taxes, JPS, Terry Ann Gibbs, doing business as legal counsel. Uh, number two, the acceptance by a collector, debt collector for any purpose, for any person on a, of a check or other payment instrument post dated by more than five days unless such person is notified in writing of a debt collector's intent to deposit such check or instrument not more than 10 nor less than three business days prior to such deposit. Number three, the solicitation by a debt collector for, of any post-dated check or other post-dated payment instrument for the purpose of threatening or instituting criminal prosecution. Number four, depositing or threatening to deposit any post-dated check or other post-dated payment instrument prior to the debt on such check. Do you guys remember that scene in that movie, Ice Age? Um, no, it was Penguins. It was one of the Penguins. And they were, uh, Robin Williams was playing that, that Penguin character that had that Coca-Cola plastic thing around his neck and it hindered his ability to speak proper. Anyways, at one point, I think it was him, he was hoarding a whole bunch of stones and one of the penguins were asking him, why is he hoarding all these stones? That reminds me of the Federal um, Reserve um, notes that people claim to be super rich. Anyways, causing charges, number five, causing charges to be made to any person for communications by concealment of the true purpose of the communication. Such charges include, but are not limited to, collect telephone calls and telegram fees. Such charges include, but are not limited to, collect telephone calls or telegram fees. Number six, taking or threatening to take any non-judicial judicial action to affect this position or displacement of property if, A, there is no present right to possession of the property claimed as collateral through an enforceable security interest, B, there is no, like, there's no contract, so if you don't have a contract, and you didn't sign a contract between you and Terry Ann Gibbs, I'm just using her name as that's who we're dealing with at this particular moment in time. But John Smith, Susan Bob, whoever, where is the contract? Number B, there is no present intention to take possession of the property or the property is exempt by law from such dispossession or displacement. Number seven, communicating with the consumer regarding a debt postcard, a debt by postcard. That's like um, the, the text messages we get here. Number eight, using any language or symbol other than the debt collector's address or any envelope with communi when communicating with a consumer by use of the mails or by telegram, except that a debt collector may use his business name if such name does not indicate that he is in the debt collection business. So in our case, we simply want matters discharged and notes returned. 15 U.S.C. 1692-G, 809. These are um, tax and numbers that we've sent to all parties. JPS. All right. Validation of debt. No, Carrie Ann Gibbs. <laughs> notice of A, notice of debt contents. Within five days after the initial communication with the consumer in connection with the uh, collection of any debt, a debt collector shall, unless the following information is contained in the initial communication or the consumer has paid the debt, send the consumer a written notice containing the amount of the debt. Number one, 
Number two, the name of the creditor to whom the debt is owed. So you know you send out those debt validation notices, people, and you always write who's the original creditor, send me the contract, validation of debt, this is what it's talking about. Who is the creditor and to whom is the debt owed? Because we are the creators of all things. God created everything, government or ordinance department, the so-called utility institution, third-party interlopers, people, John Smith, Bob Jones, whoever they are, claiming a debt. Are they the original creditors on the particular note instrument, what have you, security, mortgage, utility, whatever? Who are they? Number three, a statement that unless a consumer within 30 days or after receipt of the notice disputes the validity of the debt or any portion thereof, the debt will be assumed to be valid by the debt collector. Hence, I have raised valid position. I've sent laws to Terry Ann Gibbs, Catherine Francis, Emeru Williams, Wendy Ann Johnson. Not one party has written me back with any proper laws to support their claim. Okay? Number four, a statement that if the consumer notifies the debt collector in writing within the 30-day period that the debt or any portion thereof is disputed, the debt collector will obtain verification of the debt or a copy of a judgment against the consumer and a copy of such verification or judgment will be mailed to the consumer by the debt collector. And number five, a statement that upon the consumer's written request within the 30-day period, the debt collector will provide the consumer with the name and address of the original creditor if, the differ if different from the current creditor. So my question stands, who is the original creditor? B, disputed debts. If the consumer notifies the debt collector in writing within the 30-day period described in subsection A, of this section that the debt or any portion thereof is disputed or that the consumer requests the name and address of the original creditor, the debt collector shall cease collection of the debt or any disputed portion thereof until the debt collect collector obtains verification of the debt or a copy of a judgment or the name and address of the original creditor and a copy of such verification of judgment or name and address of the original creditor is mailed to the consumer by the debt collector collection activities and communications that do not otherwise violate the subchap this subchapter may continue during the 30-day period referred to in subsection a unless the consumer has notified the debt collector in writing that the debt or any portion of the debt is disputed or that the consumer requests the name and address of the original creditor any collection activity any collection activities and communication during, oh Lord, hang on, during, I lost my way here, uh, collection and writing of that the debt or any portion of that debt is disputed or that the consumer requests the name and address of the original creditor, any collection activities and communication during the 30-day period may not overshadow to be inconsistent with the disclosure of the consumer rights to dispute the debt or request the name and address of the original creditor, which I've done. So hence, you guys out there listening to this, I have sent off all written stuff far and wide, globally, for these parties here to stand up lawfully. C, admission of liability. The failure of a consumer to dispute, to dispute the validity of a debt under this section may not be construed by any court or as an admission of liability by the consumer. Legal pleadings. I'll read that again. Admission of liability. The failure of a consumer to dispute the validity of a debt under this section may not be construed by any court as an admission of liability by the consumer. So I didn't, exactly. So I didn't say I'm responsible for any of this stuff or is liable for anything that um, I've written and... Um, yeah, despite the fact being threatened to forward notes. All right, legal pleadings. A communication in the form of a formal pleading in a civil action shall not be treated as an initial communication for the purposes of subsection A. E, notice provisions, the sending of de or delivery of any form or notice which does not relate to the collection or of any of a debt and is expressly required by Title 26, Title V of Graham, Leach, Bliley, Bliley, B-L-I-L-E-Y, 
Act in parentheses brackets 15 USC 6801 ETSEQ in brackets period comma or any provision of federal or straight state law relating to notice of data security breach or privacy or any regulation prescribed under any such provision of law shall not be treated as an initial communication in connection with the debt collection for purposes of this section. You know what I'm really grateful for? I can speak. There was a time I couldn't even speak. I can speak clearly. I can hear myself. Hmm. And my voice sounds really strong. I lost my ability to speak, you guys, so this is really great. 15 U.S.C. 1692-I-811. Legal actions by debt collectors. Venue. Any debt collector who brings any legal action or on any debt against any consumer shall, number one, in the case of an action to enforce an interest in real property securing the consumer's obligation, bring such action only in a judicial district or similar legal entity in which such real property is located, or number two, in the case of an action not described in paragraph one, bring such action only in the judicial district or similar legal entity. A, in which such consumer signed the contract sued upon, or in B, in which such consumer resides at the commencement of the action. B, authorization of actions. Nothing in this subchapter shall be construed to authorize the bringing of legal action by debt collectors. 15 U.S.C. 1692 J. 812. Furnishing certain deceptive forms. A. It is unlawful to design, compile, and furnish any form knowing that such form would be used to create of the false belief in a consumer that a person other than the creditor or such consumer is participating in the collection or in any in an attempt to collect the debt such consumer allegedly owes such creditor when in fact such person is not so participating. Doesn't that sound familiar when you go to the JPS office and these workers sit there and have you sign a piece of paper that they don't sign, they just look at you and look like you're from Mars and you sign it all right to serve by the name such and such? Hmm. Doesn't this sound interesting like a mortgage lender who's purporting a pretender lender giving you a mortgage paper to sign and they're not signing it, but you are? Number B, any person who violates this section shall be liable to the same extent and, with in, and in the same manner as a debt collector is liable under Section 1692K of this title for failure to comply with a provision of this subchapter. I think you all need to play that over again a few times so it can really register. What we're trying to tell you, 15 U.S.C., 1692K, 813, civil liability, amount of damages, number A, letter A, except as otherwise provided by this section, any debt collector who fails to comply with any provision of this subchapter with respect to any person is liable to such person in an amount equal to the sum of, what, any actual damage sustained by the, such person as a result of such failure. Hmm. What does two concussions mean for somebody? What is the value of that liability-wise? I don't know. Number two, A, in the case of any such action by an individual, such additional damages as the court may allow but not exceeding 1,000, or B, in the case of a class action, such amount for each named plaintiff as could be recovered under subparagraph A and, I think that's two in brackets, such amount, as the court may allow for all other case class members without regard to a minimum individual recovery nor not to exceed the lesser of 500,000 or one per centum of the net worth of the debt collector. Hmm. Hmm. Number three, in the case of any successful action to enforce the foregoing liability, the costs of the action together with reasonable Attorney's fees is determined by the court on a finding by the court that an action under this section was brought in bad faith. See, I always say I come in good faith. I pay in good faith. Whenever I write, I always do that. In bad faith. And for the purpose of harassment, the court may award to the defendant's attorney's fees reasonable in relation to the work expended and cost. I wonder what my fee is. Because my trespass fee starts at 10,000 notes. 
B, factors considered by court. In determining the amount of liability in any action under subsection A of this section, the court shall consider among other relevant factors. Hence, I send out all angels and all authorities globally to go and fight this matter on my behalf. Use one's copyright infringement fees, trespass fees, take out your fee and deal with these parties properly. B, factors considered by court. In determining the amount of liability in any action under subsection A of this section, the court shall consider among other relevant factors. Number one, in any individual action under subsection A2, A in brackets, two in brackets, A in brackets, capital A in brackets, small a started, uh, common A initially. Of this section, the frequency and persistence of non-compliance by any debt collector, the nature of such non-compliance and the extent to which such non-compliance was intentional, or number two, in any class action under subsection A to B, that's a capital B at the end there, um, of, and they're all in brackets, of this section, the frequency and persistence of non-compliance by the debt collector, the nature of such non-compliance, the resources of this debt collector, the number of persons adversely affected, and the extent to which the debt collector's non-compliance was intentional. Intent, number C. A debt collector may not be held liable in any action brought under this subchapter if the debt collector shows by a preponderance of evidence that the violation was not intentional and resulted from a bona fide error notwithstanding the maintenance of procedures reasonable adapted to avoid any such error. Jurisdiction. An action to enforce any liability created by the, this subchapter may be brought in any appropriate United States District Court without regard to the, app, to the amount in controversy or in any other court of competent jurisdiction within one year from the date on which the violation occurs. Now, Terry Ann Gibbs um, doing business as um, legal counsel for Jamaica Public Service mentioned in her letter to me yesterday, July, um, what date was that? 17th, 2017, that Jamaica is separate from the United States. Anybody out there listening to this, if that's true, send it to me. If she doesn't fall under the Fair Debt Collections Practices Act and what is stipulated for all of us as consumers, let me know. Send it to me in writing by within 24 hours of receipt of this um, message, this YouTube video. Advisory opinions of Bureau, and, and then explain to me why they're listed under the IRS, why Jamaican private or corporate nation award status is under the IRS and the Federal Trade Commission, and why the Federal Trade Commission um, is corresponding with the governance here, the de facto governance here. All right, advisory opinions of the Bureau E. No provision of this section imposing any liability shall apply to any act done or omitted in good faith in conformity, conformity with any advisory opinion of the Bureau, notwithstanding that after such act or omission has occurred, such opinion is amended, rescinded, or determined by judicial or other authority to be invalid or for any reason. 15 U.S.C. 1692, I think that's I or L. Anyway, 814, Administrative Enforcement. The Federal Trade Commission shall be authorized excuse me, to enforce compliance with the subchapter except to the extent that enforcement of the requirements imposed under this subchapter is specifically committed to another government agency. Mm. Under any paragraphs, one in brackets through five in brackets or su of subsection B, there's that word off again, Subject to title, subtitle B of the Consumer Financial Protection Act of 2010. By the way, I did send this off to them as well. Uh, 12 U.S.C. 5511 ETSEQ period in brackets. For purpose of this exercise by the Federal Trade Commission of its functions and powers under the Federal Trade Commission Act 15 U.S.C. 41 ETSEQ in brackets, a violation of this subchapter shall be deemed... Um, an unfair or deceptive act or practice in violation of the act, of that act. All of the functions and powers of the Federal Trade Commission under the Federal Trade Commission Act are available to the Federal Trade Commission to enforce compliance by any person 
with this subchapter, irrespective of whether that person is engaged in commerce or meets any other jurisdictional tests under the Federal Trade Commission Act, including the power to enforce the provisions of the subchapter in the same manner as in the violation, as if the violation had been a violation of the Federal Trade Commission trade regulation rule. All right, now coming down to the bottom here, B, applicable provisions of law. Um, I'm going to scroll down. You guys can read that section yourselves. Agency powers for the purpose of the exercise by any agency referred to in subsection B. Of this section of its powers under the any act referred to in, subsec in that subsection, a violation of any requirement imposed under this subchapter shall be deemed to be in the violation of a requirement imposed under the, that act. You guys can finish reading that. Reports to Congress by the Bureau of Views or other federal agencies, 15 U.S.C. 6092M, not later than one year after the effective date of the subchapter at one year. Intervals thereafter, the Bureau shall make reports to the, to the Congress concerning the administration of its function. You guys can finish reading that one. 816, relation to state law. This subchapter does not annual alter or affect or exempt any person subject to the provisions of this subchapter from complying with the laws of any state. There's that word of again with respect to debt collection practices. You can finish reading that. The state law is not inconsistent with its subchapter if the protection such law affords any consumer is greater than the protection provided by the subchapter. Exemption for state regulation 817, 15 U.S.C. 1692O, the Bureau shall by regulation exempt from the requirements of this subchapter any class or debt collection practices within any state in the, if the Bureau determines that under the law of that state the class of debt collection practices subject to requirements substantially similar to those imposed by this subchapter and that there is adequate provision for enforcement. Exception for certain bad check enforcement programs operated by private entities, 818, treatment in general, A, number one, treatment of certain private entities subject to paragraph two. A private entity shall be excluded from the definition of debt collector pursuant to the exception provided in section 6092.86 of this title with respect to the operation by the entity of a program described in paragraph 2, A, under a contract described in paragraph 2, B. Conditions of applicability, you, can, you guys can read that. State district attorney establishes within the jurisdiction of such state, or this is a district attorney, and with respect to alleged bad check violations that do not involve a check described in subsection B, a pretrial diversion program for alleged bad check defenders who agree to participate voluntarily in such program to avoid criminal prosecution. And then it talks about private entity in B, in the course of performing duties in C, and then one, two, and three complies with the penal laws of the state, conforms with the terms of the contract and directives of the state of district attorney. Uh, three, does not ex exercise independent prosecu prosecutorial discretion, and then it goes on to contracts, any alleged offender referred to in subparagraph A, and it goes all the way down. We see certain checks excluded, um, definitions in C, state of district attorney means a chief elected or appointed prosecuting attorney in a district county as defined in section 2 of title 1, a municipality or comparable jurisdiction including state Attorney General who act as chief elected or appointed prosecuting attorneys in a district county as so defined municipality or comparable jurisdiction. By the way, I sent this off to the Minister of Finance here as well. Um, yeah, Mr. Everton McFlurrigan, I think his name is. Um, I think his assistant, Maxine, um, I forget the last name, who may be referred to by a variety of such titles such as district attorneys, prosecuting attorneys, commonwealth attorneys, solicitors, county attorneys, and state attorneys, and who are responsible for the prosecution of state crimes and violations of jurisdiction-specific local ordinances. Check, the term check has the same meaning as in section 5002 in bracket 6 of title 12. Bad check violation means a violation of applicable state criminal law relating to the writing of dishonored checks, and then 819 effective date end notes, legislative history, and that's pretty much it. So to all those listening, do your own research, do your diligence. 
I like Shuttleworth versus Birmingham, Alabama. Check out that case. Shuttleworth versus Birmingham, Alabama. We have right to travel without a license, registration, or insurance, which to me also means that I don't have a printing press for the Federal Reserve notes. I can't print any of the stuff out of thin air like they can. So I have been given some settlement discharge um, numbers and some taxonomy numbers. I like those used for these as a small entity, as a rose asexual plant. Um, yeah, I'd like those utilized in all matters pertaining to one here and one's offspring. Um, those of you listening to this who are unclear, go back, listen to this um, video over and over again until it registers. Uh, Trinzi versus Pagliaro, I like that case. And look at that Montgomery. I think it's Montgomery versus Gilliam. I want to see Gilliam. Um, it's a case whereby the um, judge um, stated that he could pay in frankincense and myrrh, and then he later went on to say he can pay in coffee beans, hence the gentleman paid in coffee beans and has been doing so to date. So, if this entity, Terry Ann Gibbs, is accepting coffee beans, and, um, yeah, the Supreme Court case ruling stand, and I can find a bunch of coffee beans or grow them myself, maybe we'll be doing that. <laughs> So, um, but yeah, I'd like it settled and discharged, guys, um, proper, lawfully, now. I think we've sent you enough information for you to do your own research, and somebody pick up a book and read. Call the authorities, they'll help you. Ask for help, they'll send you the information you require. Those of you starting out, I suggest you um, write to the Federal Trade Commission, put in a complaint, an affidavit of truth, preferably by mail. In our case, we didn't have that luxury, but... Um, you can send a lot of stuff with two cent and three cent stamps using your thumbprint and reading, your right hand thumbprint, and um, stick to the laws. I think they're there for us. They were created for us. I come in good faith by Angelina L. All rights reserved. Moabite Moore. Plant seed rose. Take care and have a great day.